And so Alexandra is a science leader uh, in nucleic acid innovation within the molecular and cell biology team at the National Measurement Laboratory, uh, which is part of, uh, which is associated to LGC. And so she's located in, the, in, the, in, in England, in the UK. And she, uh, since 2009, she has been working there where she has focused on the use of digital PCR in a wide range of applications. And she will talk about a number of these uh, uh, today, and she's worked with almost all of the commercially available di uh, digital PCR platforms, uh, which is, uh, and has given a large number of presentations at conferences and workshops on the experimental and an analytical considerations needed for the uh, digital PCR. And so today she will talk about uh, supporting microgenomics measurements in precision medicine and engineering biology using digital PCR. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm having a slight technical issue here where I can't see the slides that everybody else can see. So Wendy is going to click the slides on for me and I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation open here and hopefully stay in sync with what I'm saying relating to the slides. So if the is my presentation loaded? Yes, it is. Great. And are we on the title slide? So the yes. uh, supporting, brilliant. Okay. So I'll just, um, I'll say next slide, if what I'm saying doesn't relate at all to what you can see on the screen, um, then I'll rely on Wendy or Dan to uh, jump in and, and tell me. So Wendy, if you could go on to the um, next slide, please. Challenges in microgenomic analysis. Done. Fantastic, right. Hopefully we will stay on track now. So uh, this slide serves to give an overview of the webinar. Um, and I started off thinking about what, what exactly is microgenomic analysis? And I came through various definitions, but ultimately it's the analysis of one or a small number of cells, genomes, genes. And we would achieve that measurement by looking at the measurement of RNA or DNA but you could also look at the protein, so the gene product, or we could look at cells. And while the work we've been doing hasn't sort of been focusing completely on microgenomic analysis, actually a lot of the challenges associated with these kind of measurements, we, we do every day. So if we think about trace detection, um, this would be finding out something, um, uh, detecting a molecule that's at a very low concentration, like sort of five to 10 molecules in a sample. So we need an accurate and precise way of measuring that. We need to have a, a low false positive rate. So we want to know that when something is there, we will detect it. When something isn't there, we won't detect it. And then one of the really big key areas that we've been looking at over the last few years has been reproducible measurements. So it's particularly in the diagnostic space, what what we want is if someone is has a disease, they're diagnosed in this particular hospital, but had they gone to a different hospital, they, they'd have the same diagnosis. And then in the precision medicine area, the diagnosis would then lead on to stratified medicine. So a particular medicine based on what their disease characteristics are. One of the other areas we've looked at is mixes of cells. So this is where you have cell heterogeneity. So it may be that you have groups of cells that you, you don't necessarily know what they are. And I'm going to give you an example um, with the gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9 later, but also rare cells. So if you've got a million cells and there's one cell in there that you're really interested in, can we pull that single cell out? So this would be things like circulating tumor cells or in the regenerative medicine space where we've used cells to become another cell product? Have we got any remaining cells left? And so how would we approach these challenges? Well, the two main methods that we would use would be a sequencing-based method or a PCR-based methods. And ultimately, we have been developing digital PCR to measure DNA and RNA. And we've been using these instruments for about 10 years and pretty much all of the commercially available system, um, systems have been through our lab, so we have got our hands on them. So I'm not gonna go into any of the technical aspects of digital PCR in this webinar. In fact, I have a three hour workshop that I run on it. Um, so it will be slightly top level. So if you have any questions about digital PCR, please pop them in the questions or we can um, deal with it offline after this talk. So next slide, please, Wendy. 
Okay. So why are we, thank you. So why are we interested in digital PCR? Well, it counts the number of molecules. So what it does is it takes a normal PCR or a real-time PCR with probes, and then it partitions that straight away. And what we have here on this screen is just two examples of an output with um, uh, a single probe for the sort of bottom middle one, and then um, a duplex reaction on the side. And each of those dots is one of those tiny partitions. And we can count those partitions. And because there's no calibration, it's this absolute quantification. We're not converting uh, the, a CQ value into an amount. We have an absolute quantification measurement. So it's calibration free. So what we can do then with digital is either measure sample directly or we can use it to calibrate other methods so for a real-time pcr if you have a calibration curve we can put a digital value assignment on that rather than say taking a nanodrop reading that we've then converted using the molecular weight of the dna that we think is in there etc which we know can introduce a sort of bias of up to about 30 percent and because of this way of counting, we can get really reproducible measurements. It can be really, really sensitive. We can get down to five copies in a reaction. But it's also got this predictable precision because by counting the molecules, they behave in a, um, the, the partitions, they behave in a very predictable manner. We can apply binomial statistics and Poisson statistics to actually estimate very accurately and very precisely how many molecules are in there. Next slide, please, Wendy. So I'm going to give three examples. I'm going to start with the trace detection. Then I'm going to look at sort of cell heterogeneity and CRISPR within this webinar. So next slide, please, Wendy. So I'm going to start with a project we had running with Euromet, um, part of the European Metrology Research Programme, which was called BioCytrace. And one of the main aims of this was to try and put SI traceability on DNA, DNA measurements but also to look at reproducibility. Um, it was also to try and um, uh, uh, sort out that there's a lack of reference materials that give this SI traceable traceability. So we looked at KRAS, um, uh, it's clinically relevant gene, uh, part of personalized stratified medicine. Um, you get mutations in 40% of colorectal cancers, but it's in, it's in lots of other cancers but it is associated with poor prognosis. There's a, there's a very good um, uh, treatment, which is the anti-EGFR antibodies, but this doesn't work if you have these mutations. So if you have wild type KRAS, this drug works very well. If you have mutations in KRAS, it doesn't work very well at all. And so actually the FDA approved this drug only when you could prove that a patient had wild type KRAS. So this was a real need to be able to detect the low level KRAS mutations. Next slide, please, Wendy. So we focused on um, false positive rates and reproducibility in this particular area. So I just want to start with um, this study that we published a few years ago in analytical chemistry, where we recruited 21 labs. Um, they were recruited based entirely on the fact that they happened to have the digital PCR instrument in question in their lab. And we sent them four samples containing challenging samples. So very low concentrations of KRAS G12D mutations in a wild type background. So the difference between this mutant and the wild type is a single nucleotide. So we were looking at measuring these with an SNV assay, a single nucleotide variant assay, where you detect the wild type with one probe and you detect the mutant with another probe. And I've just got one of the samples up there, which was sample A. And this was a low concentration sample, about five copies um, uh, per microliter concentration at about 1% G12D in the wild type. And what you can see is 18 of the labs um, were al almost giving identical results. And remember, this was without calibration. They've literally taken the positive partitions, counted them, and then given us um, the, the copy number concentration. So we've got the three outliers, which we then went and had a look at. And really what we discovered was it was caused by incorrect data analysis rather than the, um, the labs were genuinely giving us a much lower, um, lower result. And what we did was provide guidelines as part of this publication. And really this fed into the DMIKI guidelines, which is 
um, was uh, uh, written about 10 years ago to try and support authors in understanding how to design experiments, but also how to analyze their data. Next slide, please. Wendy. So we also looked at the reproduci reproducibility between platforms. So thinking in an agnostic angle in, in regards to the platform, what, what we wanted to look at was if it's absolute quantification, you just count, then, then all the platforms should give us the same result. And so we ran a, a similar platform um, panel of materials, not the same as what we used in the Interlab study. And what we found, we got highly reproducible results between the platforms. In fact, there were only 10% difference um, in the eight samples. I'm showing you just three samples in this graph. And this is absolutely incredible because we've done studies in the past with real-time PCR where we're talking logs difference between labs, you know, like three logs difference when we're in the sort of infectious disease diagnostic space. So this was absolutely incredible. And part of this paper, um, we actually put it forward as a primary reference measurement procedure. And what that means is it's traceable back to an SI unit. And in this case, that unit is the unit of counting. And we submitted this to the Joint Committee Traceability in Laboratory Medicine or the JCTLM, both of them are a little bit of a mouthful, um, which is a database of materials and methods to help people select SI traceable methods and materials. And this was the first time um, a method had been submitted on looking at DNA based on its sequence. So not based on its actual um, components like amount of phosphate, et cetera, but actually based on the sequence. And the reason this matters is because if you're looking at a sample with say five molecules and you've got a calibrator that is slightly out you may be thinking you're measuring 50 molecules or 0.5 molecules, in which case you might think your method is either highly sensitive or massively insensitive. And it's really because your calibrator isn't calibrated correctly. Uh, next slide, please, Wendy. So I just want to finish up this section in thinking about false positive rate. And if we think about PCR and the way that PCR works with the primers that bind, a well-designed PCR should have really no false positive rate. The false positive rate comes from misbinding of primers to other areas of the genome and producing an amplicon or background contamination. Um, you might have something like 16S or ALU where it's almost impossible to get um, a negative result in water only control or in a sample that doesn't have your target. And so when we look at the um, SNV assays, so this is the wild type and the um, KRAS mutant in this particular example, um, what we want to do is look at that false positive rate where it's really probe cross hybridization. And this is where you have a wild type molecule and wild type amplicon, but that, that mutant probe is binding and giving a signal. So what I've got here is a figure lifted from the DMIKI um, update that we published last year of our, a wild type dilution series. So there is no G12D molecules in this series. And um, we measured it with uh, the duplex assay. And what we can see is that the wild type is linear over that full range. Um, we can see towards the top, the highest concentration, we have no measurement, that's because everything, all the partitions were positive. And so we can't really infer much about the concentration other than there's a lot. But if we look at the black diamonds in this, in this particular graph, we can see that it's dynamic, it isn't linear. And so there's an issue down at the low wild type concentration because really it's, it's sampling. We haven't got enough molecules in there to have enough amplicon that allows that cross hybridization. And we can see that it, towards the middle of the graph along the x-axis, we can see it starts to stabilize. And for this particular assay, it stabilizes at about 0.03%. So it's, it's very low. And then again, if we have too many wild type molecules, we also stop being able to measure a false positive rate. So it's dynamic, and this needs to be taken into consideration when we're looking at that trace detection. Next slide, please, Wendy. So I'm going to slightly change tact here and talk about the one cell in a million or the cell heterogeneity. Next slide, please, Wendy. 
and think about that sampling issue. So if we needed to pick out one cell in a million, how, how, do we, how do we even start doing that? Can we actually sample from a million cells? Well, we've got a sampling issue there. You know, would we have to do three million, five million? Even then, we're only going to find five cells. And then we have an issue with reproducibility. So what we can look at is rather than looking at the DNA um, directly, where we're going to get expect two copies for most targets, uh, two targets per cell, we can start to look at the RNA and we can look for specific expression patterns, or we could look at the micro RNA profile, which we know is highly abundant. And so therefore, rather than trying to do pre-amplification of the DNA, which we know can introduce a lot more bias than um, just measuring very low concentration, if we can start to look at um, a highly, highly expressed marker, then that will um, effectively be an enrichment. Next cell, please. Um, sorry, next slide, please, Wendy. So we developed an assay um, using uh, the microRNA targets um, with the TACMAN approach. And we initially just made mixes of total RNA um, from two different cell lines to um, simulate different numbers of the minority single cell in the million. And that was what we used to develop the assay. We had three microRNA targets for our rare cell, and we had two endogenous that would uh, cover all cells. And then what we did was a cell seeding approach. We validated it by actually uh, laser capture of single cells into a million mesenchyme cells. And we looked at capturing 10 cells, five cells, one and zero. Next slide, please, Wendy. And as a snapshot of some of that data, um, it, it worked really well with the microRNA. So I've got it color coded with blue being 10 and red being zero. And then we've got green and orange um, as five cells and one cell. And what we can see is clear differences. I mean, there's air, loads of space between the 10, the, the blue um, box and whisker and the red. We can see a little bit of variability again, could possibly be down to the technical aspects where we didn't actually capture 10 cells, we maybe captured nine, um, because as with all these things, we were sampling. And so it just adds to the technical noise. But ultimately, what this shows is that if you select your target uh, appropriately for the question that you're trying to ask and what you're trying to achieve, digital PCR can do this because it doesn't need the calibration, which is always so difficult to sit and work out, well, what, what would I use as a calibrant if I was to run this on real-time PCR in order to convert down to copies, number of cell equivalents per million cells? And so this was a really nice example. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna finish up the talk by looking at um, one of our slightly newer areas that we've started looking at in the gene editing um, uh, engineering biology space. And I'm gonna give some examples of some of the assays we've designed um, to look at CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Next slide, please, Wendy. And a few years ago, we had a collaboration with Desktop Genetics, who are a synthetic, um, uh, synthetic company who uh, designed software uh, for designing and identifying PAM sites to design guides, which are needed uh, for the CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, this was a grant funded by SymbiCity. And ultimately, as I'm sure every, many people are aware, the um, CRISPR-Cas9 targets a specific region using a guide against the RNA. And the um, Cas9 comes along and creates a double-stranded break in the DNA. The process then um, uses, exploits the natural cellular mechanisms to repair the break. So cells don't like having double-stranded breaks. And so you have two main mechanisms, the non-homologous and joining, NEHJ, um, which is very quick, but very error prone. And then you also have the homology director repair, which is much more accurate and it will use the um, homologous chromosome to tell it what it should be, but it takes a lot longer. So one of the most common methods used to screen edited sequences is NGS, um, but there are lots of publications that use real-time PCR and there's now quite a few using digital. The advantage of NGS is that you could do whole genome sequencing, so you can identify the actual sequence you've introduced, 
look at the on-target effects, um, but also identify off-target, off-target being a change you've made in the cell that you didn't intend to make. And what we were use, doing with desktop was seeing if we could design a digital PCR assay based on the, the, the guide sequences to target the particular region to try and get a quite a quick um, method for screening the, um, the big heterogeneous population of cells. So this is after you've run your CRISPR, after you've done any selection, but before you've done any of the sort of single colony picking. And really to get a, a, a metric on that editing efficiency, because that could then lead in to what do I do for my um, workflow down? I've, I've uh, validated eight different guides. These three really haven't worked by digital, but I can see that these five have. So I might take these five forwards or I will pick one that seems to be much more efficient at the editing process than the others. Next slide, please, Wendy. So if I just start with the gene knockout quantification, so this is where we have created the double-stranded break. We haven't given the cell any direction as to what change we want it to make. We're just going to exploit that any NHEJ repair, which gives us um, hopefully a, a frame shift or a small deletion, um, which will essentially knock out the function of that gene by um, introducing a frame shift, premature, stop codon, et cetera. So what we would expect to have in a, a genomic DNA extraction from these kind of cells is the wild type molecules. So these will be the ones that just weren't cut. CRISPR is a multi-stage process. So we need a lot of things to happen before that cut can even happen. Or it's been cut and repaired correctly. So it now no longer looks any different to a normal wild type molecule. And then the knockout molecules. And what, of course, is interesting here is every time a cell repairs, it will do that independently of all the other cells. So actually, all those knockout molecules will be ever so slightly different. So we needed a method that would be able to distinguish between world type and something else. And I've, I've already set, mentioned this on the previous slide. Um, so we want to get the screening method before we pick the colonies and we want to be able to get some kind of editing efficiency metric on it. Uh, next slide, please, Wendy. So what we uh, what we used was hybrid duplex assays. Um, so this is where you have a single pair of primers and it amplifies up quite a large amplicon. And you have two probes that bind. One is the universal probe. So that is away from the cut site. And then one is a wild type probe. We know the wild type sequence. So we design a probe that goes over that cut site. The little cross on, on this schematic um, is uh, demonstrating the change. And we might get a small insertion, deletion, um, or, or a, um, a nucleotide variant. Next slide, please. And this is an output of the, um, the dot plot that comes um, from the QX200 instrument that's made by Biorad. So I've got the universal peak fluorescence along the x-axis. So that is my hex probe. So that will bind to everything. I've then got my wild type peak, peak fluorescence up the y-axis. So this will only be binding to my wild type amplicons. And then I put in some pink uh, horizontal and vertical lines to separate out the groups. And what we have is some partitions that didn't have a molecule in them at all. We've got some partitions that only gave us that universal signal. So we know they're mutant. And then we've got this big orange um, uh, cluster that's distending down. And those are just the wild type only molecules. So we're getting signal from both probes, but also by chance, we will have some partitions that have both a mutant and both a wild type, and they will also sit in there. And I don't have a mouse, but hopefully you can see towards the top right, there's quite a dense cluster, and then it sort of like smears down a little bit. So it's within those double positives. Now, because I said uh, right at the beginning, there's quite predictable uh, maths involved here, we can actually, just by counting the number of partitions in those three, um, uh, sections, which have been pseudocolored differently, and we can work out that about 12% of our molecules were knockout. Can I have the next slide, please? So we were interested then in taking this concept a little bit further and looking at the knock-in quantification. And um, 
there's a, there's a few papers out there that look at a very similar strategy. So we realize with the knocking, you've got a whole extra level of complication. You've got the well type molecules repaired or not repaired, um, not cut. Um, you've then got all those knockout molecules that will still occur. And then you've got the knock in molecules, which is where it's been cut and then repaired with that HDR um, uh, mechanism. Next slide, please, Wendy. So all that means is that our, our assay design gets just a little bit more complicated. So we have the same process before, a larger amplicon. We have our universal probe, and then we've got our wild type probe. But because we're trying to introduce a particular sequence, we can actually design a probe against that. <coughs> and this is called tandem probe multiplexing. And if you look at this, you can see I've moved the wild type and the universal onto the same fluorophore, which in real time PCR would just increase the signal and so might just look like there was more molecules in there to begin with. But in digital PCR, if we pop up the next slide, please, Wendy, we get, we get um, two different groups where we get more endpoint fluorescent because there's two positives. So um, I'm gonna have to try and talk you through this rather than use a mouse. So we've got, I've put a heat map on here, but if we look at the bottom left, we can see that there's three populations, the empty ones that are called C naught, the knockout ones, C, CKO and C wild type. So the wild type ones have both probes binding, but the knockout have only a single probe binding. And then what we have up the y-axis, which is now going to be the knock-in, anything above this pink line contains a knock-in molecule. So we can actually count now the proportion of molecules that have the knock-in, what we want, to the point that all the probes bind, but also we have the knockout efficiency as well. So one of the things we did after that, next slide please, Wendy, was then compare it with sequencing. Now, um, Dan gave a very nice overview of why Amplicon sequencing um, can, can sometimes be um, uh, a little bit limiting. And what we found was, um, here I've got the wild type and I've got the knock-in. We use the MySeq and the Amplicon sequencing with the same prime as we use for digital. And while this is really nice, because it allows us to actually see the sequence, um, so we can also see the error rate that we get in our wild type, we can actually see these really nice big deletions that we're getting in the knockout molecule. And actually, unfortunately, in the screenshot, I don't have an example of um, the knock-in molecule um, working, um, sorry, not working um, um, within the illustration. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Wendy? But what we can do is put these two methods head to head. So what I've got here is the wild type. I've then got a procedure control. So this was a sample that went through the whole CRISPR process, but it was targeting a totally different region. So it, for all intents and purposes, it's wild type at the, at the locus. And then I've got the knock-in. So this is what I showed you um, on the previous slide. Um, and then I've got a knock-in times three. And this is where actually um, the knock-in sequence that was put in was put in three times in tandem. And this is really interesting because essentially what happened was when we compare digital with NGS, we get a much greater proportion of the NHEJ molecules. And when we looked at the sequences, if you remember from the slide before, we had quite a lot of um, deletions. And of course, because we were doing an amplicon based approach, those deletions have an advantage over the wild type in that they're smaller. And they have an even further advantage over our knock-in molecules because we were actually trying to generate a 300 to 350 base pair amplicon for the knock-in, whilst the wild type and the knockout were more like 150, 200. So of course, they were just underrepresented. And in fact, we only we got less than 1% of the molecules were this three times, three times knock-in. So at that point, I'm going to end the webinar. Next slide, please, Wendy and just summarize what I've told you. Uh, like I said, I could probably talk for, for hours and hours about this, and um, I haven't even touched on infectious diseases, um, which is uh, such a hot topic at the moment. So I just want to finish with my summary slide, um, and I hope I've shown you some examples where we've used digital PCR to show that you can get really reproducible measurements, in very challenging assays, you know, looking at single nucleotide differences, both between labs and between digital platforms. 
since we did that work, there's been another um, a number of other instruments that have come on the platform. Um, sorry, come on the market, and we are looking at those as well. To um, we want them all to be within ten percent. We want all our digital um, platform providers to be giving us lovely unbiased measurements, um, but also nice, accurate, and precise measurements. We had all. 18 of those labs that were all giving us the same same result, you know, very precise measurements between them. But we can also look at that false positive rate and define it really, really well. And this is what we submitted for the primary reference method procedure. But then touch towards the end, just on the cell heterogeneity. What do we do when what we actually want is a minority cell, cell number within our sample? And so looking at the CRISPR um, gene editing, but also looking at those rare cells um, that, could be, that could be part of um, uh, drugs for like regenerative medicine. Our future work, well, I mean, I just popped up a couple of my uh, my uh, pet projects at the moment is uh, gene circuits. So this is really is moving into the engineering space where we want to know that if we if we tweak how this promoter works, does it have a, a knock on effect on the um, on another process within the cell? If we if we add in, you know, 10 times as much signaling molecule, does it? create 10 times as much product or or does the cell sort of fight back and say no no this is this is overwhelming and too much and actually start suppressing what we're doing and this we've got some really exciting work coming on with that um, but also just sort of almost back to basics when we think about bacteria and holding plasmids how many how many plasmids do they actually have in there do they just maintain one do they keep a couple you know in case you need a spare one um, so there's just some really exciting work that we've got in in the pipeline so next slide. I will finish just with my acknowledgement slide, um, just uh, acknowledging our main funders, which are BAES, um, a UK government department, um, who fund us to do research to support uh, UK science, and then um, Euromet, which support us with the rest of Europe um, and the other measurement institutes uh, to support measurement science. Um, I gave you some data from our Biocide Trace project and the Desktop Genetics project. And these are the members of my lab who contributed to all of the data that I've shown you today.